Dornhenge? Dornhenge? Is that right? Dornhager. Dornhager. Oh my it's goodness. Such, Sorry. It's such a hard pronunciation. So actually for me, when I hear like English native speakers, I'm like, okay, just say Dornhedge. It's fine. <laughs> Dornhager. Hager. I love it. Yeah. Great. Um, today we're talking about shark and ocean conservation. And Marik, you have been doing such amazing, interesting research with um, sharks and fisher fisher people, I should say, in Japan. Um, mm -hmm. I love what you're doing and I'm so excited to talk to you today. So thank you so much for joining. No, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we should start with the most recent news for sharks and I think sea conservation has been this big Netflix film that just came out called mm -hmm. what is it sea spiracy yeah now their their biggest takeaway in sea spiracy was don't eat seafood at all don't eat any fish at all because it is contributing to the killing of sharks and dolphins and whales as a way to uh the fisher people to access more of the fish and make more profits um, and it also contributes so much to the plastic pollution in our seas. Now, as someone who's actually researching what is happening in Japan, is that your takeaway or what would you suggest? Well, sea spiracy is really, really controversial and it's controversial for a reason. So I think the first thing we want to look at is the bigger picture message of the film. And there's nothing wrong with that message because they say, hey, what's happening out there in the ocean is there is something really, really wrong. And that's true. So we have we've had for decades this problem that so many of our fisheries are unregulated, unmonitored or illegal. And all of this is happening at the high seas. So uh, I think, you know, that 70 percent or over 70 percent of our planet is ocean. It's very, very hard to monitor. So a lot of crimes happen out of sea. And uh, Sea Spiracy lists a lot of these crimes. What we have is bonded labor. So effectively slavery, modern day slavery at sea, uh, violation of human rights, uh, illegal fishing, um, bycatch. So meaning incidental catch of not only fish that will be consumed, but also yeah, dolphins, seabirds, turtles, and so on. So all of this is unfortunately happening and i'm glad to see that because for me this is something i know this i've known this for years and sometimes you lose perspective as a scientist of what you know or what's so commonplace to you is not necessarily commonplace to the general public so it's like okay it was necessary for the general public to hear this message or like have another movie on this message um that this is happening we need to stop this so this is what's great about the film what was not so good, in my opinion, is um, that they basically, uh, how are we going to say it, attacked, <laughs> attacked um, several NGOs that are working on ocean uh, conservation, and that basically they all got thrown into the same, into the same pot or the same drawer, saying like, oh, what they're doing is 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 not right, um, and that basically we have a conspiracy where they're almost covering up or want to cover up what's happening at the ocean. And I say that's, I want to say it's not true. There's, there's a lot of people out there that do wonderful work. And these people include NGOs, they're researchers, and they're also fishers. So can be fishermen or fisherwomen who actually want um, a sustainable ocean and they want to fight for the survival of the ocean and, and several species. So I think th that final conclusion was a little too too black and white, and of course I have to agree that if you if you want to preserve the seas, the best thing or the safest thing you can do is don't eat any fish, um, because it's very hard to trace fish or where it's coming from. Um, so yeah, that's absolutely the, the absolutely safest thing. But for many of us, maybe we do not want to become vegan straight away. Or also for us, okay, we, so right now we live in Western countries or what developed countries, maybe it's possible for us, but there's a lot of the world's population, they do not have this choice. So it means we can't just stop fisheries now. This is just simply not gonna happen. So we, I think, yes, many of us should consume less fish or no fish, but for the other part of the human population, we have to find ways that they 
or that we overall can harvest more sustainable. So I think it's dual approach. Yeah. Um, it's mm. it's powerful. And and for me too, one of the big takeaways was you feel sorry for the people actually working in the fishing industry. Yeah. And you realize it's the same problem as so many other sustainable problems that we're having with environmentalism is it's the people at the top who are making big profits. The people actually doing mm. the work have very little rights um, very little money and doing all the dirty work, right? And then creating huge problems. Um, but I love the research that you're doing because you're talking to fishermen, uh, fisher people, fishers, <laughs> um, <laughs> about what they remember about sharks and mantas in the past and talking to younger fisher people and comparing that to try to get a more accurate uh, understanding of the decline is that right yeah that's that's correct you summarized it really well so this is something um, that also Daniel Pauly he's very famous uh, fishery scientist has talked about a lot is what we call the shifting baseline the shifting baselines means what we think how the natural world is normal now was not necessarily natural 50 years ago or 80 years ago or like basically say when our our grandfathers or our, our grand great grandparents were alive so I was talking to these very old uh, fishermen, Japanese fishermen that fished the ocean for, or the, mainly the Pacific for 60 years um, to hear what they reported on me, what species was it, what was the biomass, like so basically how many fish were there. And then talk to younger fishermen who do it now and who only started say within the last 10 years and the gap is very big. And we have no data on this because we only started doing stock assessments, which is the official term for like assessing fish stocks, uh, what is their state. We only started doing that 20, 30 years ago. So we have a big, big gap there. And we basically, we don't know, we don't have scientific data. What was the ocean like in the 1950s, 1960s when commercial fishing just started? And it has changed a lot dramatically. So can you walk us through your your research? What are your aims and objectives? So my objectives, uh, I love sharks, I think, which is uh, quite obvious from my profile. Uh, my first objective when I came in was like, um, save the sharks, basically, because they are one of the most endangered groups of fish in the ocean. We have over 500 species and a lot of the populations have crashed um, dramatically. So for example, we have the oceanic white tip, which is a pelagic shark, uh, roams all the tropical oceans in the world. And it, they used to be so abundant and now most likely due to fisheries, their populations have crashed to 99%. And these are just such dramatic numbers. And it's just something because I love scuba diving, I love free diving, I love seeing them interacting with them. It's something uh, that I wanted to stop. And one of the biggest impacts I realized on sharks, of course, every, I think everyone on this podcast is familiar with shark finning. This is not new to you. And I think most of, most of your listeners are probably like, oh, no, I don't consume shark fin soup. But we have another problem, which is bycatch, the incidental catch of sharks. And it's just so high. And that's something I really wanted to, to work on or look for solutions. How can we catch less sharks or kill sharks by accident, which is just such a tragedy so yeah there we have the piles of sharks in a fishing port yeah which is it's just shocking right you don't mm -hmm. get the impression a country like japan where a lot of the normal traditional culture or the daily culture runs on this idea of motai nai don't waste mm -hmm. and then you see that of course in japan the fishing industry is is such an important part of the economy and the culture and the traditions and the lifestyle but if they are also just wasting all of this bycatch and catching a lot of sharks and dolphins and, and even killing whales as a part of what they do, you know, this should be addressed. Um, it's shocking. But this is kind of one of the reasons that I think in your information on Save the Seas, you said this is one of the reasons it's so difficult to get data because mm -hmm. they're not documenting how much waste in bycatch, is that right? All over the world. Okay, so the problem is we started documenting too late. So we started doing this basically when things were already bad, as usual. So most stock assessments started like around the 1980s, 
And then we were like, basically that's when scientists and biologists were like, hey, we might want to keep tabs on this to see how it's changing. And just quickly going to go into the comments. I see someone made a comment. Marlins used to be, I think, in the uh, um, 2,500 numbers in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So Marlins or as a uh, swordfish. So yeah, all these large fish, they have been reduced dramatically. Um, and this is also what happened to sharks, but we don't have any firm data on it because we only have what we call anecdotal data. So we can show this about the marlins, about the sharks with looking at old logbooks, handwritten logbooks, old photos. Um, think, for example, there's a great study done in Florida, as there's so many people from the US on the, on the chat, um, sports fishing in Florida. So we didn't have much data, but what we had is these photos of like proud sports fishermen standing next to their trophy. And what we could see is the size of the fish is like go, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And that already tells us something. And then, um, Joy, just quickly getting back to what you said, so you were like, oh, what a waste. So in Japanese, we call it motainai. And of course, no one wants to have bycatch to go to waste. It doesn't always go to waste, but I think it's definitely not put to its best and highest use. So for example, those piles of sharks we see there, um, what happens a lot to the sharks that they get caught uh, by accident, so they end up as bycatch. And then in many fisheries or many countries, you're allowed to just toss them overboard, or you can take the valuable fins off, toss them overboard. This is stopping now because scientists and NGOs and the general public has spoken out against us, has said like, this is not okay. So we have now in many countries like Japan, New Zealand, uh, USA, we have regulations against this. This is not allowed anymore. So now we have to bring the whole shark back. Uh, what happens to the shark? Um, they often get ground up to fish meal. So in Japan, that means they become food like a joy that you're gonna be familiar with, like oden. Uh, Han pan, um, surimi fish cakes. So, if people are familiar with like the imitation crab meat, that's often shark. So they get ground up and they get like turned into fish paste. So it's definitely it, to me it's a sad ending, and like such a mass like mass product for an apex predator in the ocean that has such an absolutely important function in the ecosystem. What also happens a lot to sharks is uh, they become fish food for fish farming, or they become pet food. So yes, we're using the whole shark. And here we, uh, even though the piles look horrifying, this is from a Japanese fishing port, they actually have been working very, very hard on making their shark fishery sustainable. But it's very hard, it's not an easy process. So if they've been working on it, then they used to land more than 20 shark species. They've realized now a lot of these shark species, they were landing like what I mentioned before, the oceanic white tip or hammerheads they're not landing anymore. So there are regulations now, they cannot land them. If they're on the line, they have to cut them loose, release them. Do the sharks always survive? No, but at least a percentage of them. So we still need to work more on reducing bycatch. Yeah. Uh, we have a great question from mm -hmm. the HAPS team. Pablo, mm -hmm. thanks for joining. He mm -hmm. says, is eating seafood more sustainable than red meat or is it something that can be equated to each other? So is it just as bad as eating factory farm meat right now, eating seafood? That's a um, difficult question. I, it's a really good question. And I think it's very, very hard to answer because you're dealing with two different problems. So I think... Um, many here that have watched Seaspiracy or uh, have, might have also watched Cowspiracy. So or now we're under the, cove. the yeah. cove, right? Or yeah. the cove, yeah, or like red meat. Like, so let's just think um, cows for now. Mm -hmm. um, beef, maybe also some people count pork into it. So the biggest problem we have there um, A, could be animal rights uh, because how they're kept and farmed, and B is um, climate change. So red meat consumption contributes to climate change. And when we consume fish, maybe we're not contributing to climate change as much, but now we're removing potentially endangered uh, species from the sea, so we have different problems. So you're like, okay, red meat, maybe now I feel guilty for climate change. If I eat Pacific bluefin tuna, now I have to be maybe feeling guilty about eradicating endangered species or uh, plummeting fish stocks from the ocean. So it's two different problems. 
Yeah. And one of the things that I thought C. Yeah. Spiracy did really well is mm -hmm. talking about the function of sharks in the ecosystem, in mm -hmm. the water, that they are a very important predator, um, which is an important part of the balance. And also about whales and dolphins, how mm -hmm. they also keep the reefs healthier by being there. And mm -hmm. the, you know, everything, I think this is a problem for conservation on many levels, right? Uh, we as humans think, oh, we just take this one thing out. It doesn't matter if that becomes extinct. But what we're learning more and more is everything needs to be in balance, right? Yeah, exactly. So to uh, go back into scientific terms, there's something that we uh, something can happen that we call a trophic cascade. So the the food web or the food chain is there. What we call scientists call different trophic levels. So we have sharks at the top. We also have smaller sharks in the middle. So we call them apex predators, mesopredators. If we remove them or drastically reduce them, we basically turn the whole ecosystem upside down. We mess it up. We mess up the balance. Um, oh yeah, there we have a good example of Sorry. the video. I, I, I should have introed that video. I didn't realize I was clicking a video. <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's, it's a good example. You, of you have some bio. beautiful video that we want to show too. You yeah. you are a diver, of course, right? Yeah. I'm also a dive master, so I love uh, teaching people how to scuba dive. I love teaching people how to be comfortable in the ocean. This is a great example from, this is actually Canyo Island in Costa Rica, what biomass should look like in the ocean. So we should just have like an, a lo loads and loads of fish, really, really high density. And this is something we've lost, which shows us something is not right in the ocean anymore. That's so beautiful. <laughs> so are you taking this with a GoPro as well? Yeah, yeah, it's just go yeah. GoPro. So yeah, if you if you if you're not a professional photographer, we use GoPro for science a lot a lot as well. Like when we use baited remote underwater video surveys, something that some of you might have seen if you follow scientists or researchers. So we have a GoPro and we have bait and we put the two like on a reef for an hour or so and see what, what comes. It's a good way for us to measure biodiversity. Um, is, this is another thing uh, where like GoPros come in really useful for science. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your other equipment I see here? Uh, what equipment are you using in the sea and on the beach? Yeah, this is just what I was talking about. This is the, we call it a BRAF, or which is short for baited remote underwater video. Um, so we have the bait bag and you see the, the lemon sharks, their baby lemon sharks interested in the bait bag. And then in that metal contraption, so it needs to be sturdy. Uh, we have a GoPro that films uh, what kind of species and then what numbers are they coming to, to the bait. And this gives us a really good idea uh, when we're assessing biodiversity and biomass so we can um, then we can apply some calculations algorithms to estimate like oh what kind of species do we have on this reef and how are their populations doing now they're healthy yeah awesome um i just want to mention thank you so much guys for the awards and mm -hmm. as i do with all the guests i will share any income from the awards with my guest today marik on her channel Thank you so much. Um, Thank we've you. We've had some, some great questions, comments, and awards so far. Thanks so much. Um, okay, let's get back to your research a little bit. Mm -hmm. So not only doing interviews with fishermen, but you also did a really interesting project um, just outside Tokyo. There was a great example of how sustainable tourism and creating dive tourism can help protect the sharks from taking the fish out of the nets mm -hmm. that was that was really interesting can you talk about that yeah so one of my favorite shark dives in the world is just outside tokyo so it's a it's um in a place called tatayama about two hours from tokyo and this is a shark feeding dive no before maybe before some of you like oh shark feeding dive we're messing with nature um hear me out so what was happening here? So you see the sharks in the video. These are banded hound sharks, so very small sharks, about 1.5 meters uh, in size. So they're smaller than me. Um, they're very docile. They're absolutely harmless to humans. And what happened here, there's local fisheries. And these local fisheries use something 
called set nets. Set nets are um, a traditional Japanese fishing method. What you basically have is not like a net you drag through the ocean. You have like nets, kind of like walls um, that you put into a bay and that fish kind of like go in, they go like behind one wall and another, like so they all have entrance and then eventually they get trapped. Um, and the fishermen would come in the morning and see like, so you kind of like create this like aquarium with nets. Uh, they don't get entangled in a net. It just works as a barrier um, because they can't find their way out. So they, they would look in the morning and see what they caught and then can take it out. The ninth thing with a uh, set net is uh, if you don't like what's in there or you say you caught a turtle or something, you can release it. You can lift it and be like, okay, here, off you go. What happened to the fishermen there is their nets were full of banded hound sharks and they didn't want banded hound sharks. So shark fin, uh, contrary to popular belief, is not a big thing in Japan. So Japanese people are not very interested in shark fin, fin um, thankfully. So they, um, the market price of these sharks is very low. It's like 25 yen, it's about 20 cent. Um, and they had no interest in, in catching them or killing them. And eventually they had an idea. So they went to the local dive shop in the neighboring bay and they were like, hey, crazy idea. Um, our net's always full of sharks. We don't want them. We also don't want to kill them. Maybe you can lure the sharks away. This is a local uh, population to the next bay by feeding them. And they tried it and it worked. So since then, the bycatch of sharks in the fisherman's net has gone down. Uh, I think by, they said more than 80% when I interviewed them. And we have striving ecotourism for the sharks in, in the next bay. So this is such a like micro scale local project that worked really, really nice where we had fishermen collaborating with tourism operators and where it was a win-win situation for both the fishermen and humans and the sharks. And this is not always replicable. It's definitely much harder if we look at commercial scale fishing, but this is one example uh, where I want to say, this is what made me a bit sad about sea spiracy that it didn't give us more hope at the end or it didn't highlight more players um, that are actually doing something good, scientists, researchers, and also fishers. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Peter has a great question. Do yeah. other areas use these types of nets too? Um, I'm only familiar with it from Japan. So they might be uh, common in other Asian countries, especially other um, East Asian countries as well. I would have to look into that. But in Japan, yeah, they use them from Okinawa, which is tropical part of Japan, up onto more northern areas. Very, very common in local Japanese fisheries. So this is for coastal fisheries. Ah, oh, wonderful. Um, so yeah, it seems like a much better option. And in terms of uh, what I was thinking too, after the movie, and actually what Greenpeace was also saying after that movie was getting a lot of criticism, is we're not saying stop eating seafood and fish completely. Most of the world depends on that for food. Mm -hmm. But what we're saying is maybe think about cutting down or buy more local coastal fish or small fishing fisher areas or your local catch from your coastal area would be better than the bigger fish and the the trawlers try to avoid that is that what you would recommend as well absolutely absolutely so i also i see so many issues with commercial fishing so very large scale fishing that are just so hard for us to monitor and then also we just lack legislation on the high seas so the high seas is anything that's beyond countries jurisdiction so most so all countries have something that's called the eez an exclusive economic zone and it goes out for 200 miles so that's uh, that's yours so that's like all the seas that's around like that around japan japan governs and they monitor it and they treat it carefully because that's yours. Then you take responsibility and everything that's beyond is a free fall. And uh, we even then also we have other problems there, like the things like the bonded labor um, that we talked about before, slavery at sea um, or other crimes at sea. If that happens out at sea, it's under no country's jurisdiction. It's extremely, extremely hard um, to process these perpetrators. So that's why it's uh, why the high seas uh, have become so rife with crime, including fisheries and human rights populations. So 
yes, um, sustainable seafood, if we want to go local, is definitely a very, very good start because local means there's less middlemen. It's much easier to trace the source. And one of the most important thing is, of course, um, source tracing. Because people ask me, for example, oh, can I eat tuna? Can I eat salmon? Can I eat bonito? And I can't give you a blanket answer for, um, say, for example, salmon. Um, you probably don't want to eat salmon that's caught in Russia. But then there's some salmon fisheries in the US that have become fairly sustainable. We also have some salmon farming in Norway that is okay, but then other salmon farming in Norway is not okay. So the closer you to the source, the better. The smaller the fishery comes from, um, it's probably also then again easier to control it. And then if I can give more advice on picking sustainable seafood, so it's so hard for us to to trace this or to know this. If you buy a can of tuna, it rarely tells you where exactly it's coming from. But if you um, adhere to the rule of three S, which is silver, seasonal, and small, um, this is already a much better bet for it being sustainable. So small means um, swordfish, tuna, sharks, um, are out. You shouldn't be consuming this because the apex predators they exist in the ocean and low numbers. Their populations are extremely vulnerable to fisheries. Then seasonal. Seasonal fisheries means there's already some kind of regulation on them. We have a lot of seasonal fisheries in Japan. So it means they get fished for a certain time of the year, then they get given a break again. So this is good. It means there's already some kind of management in place. And then small. Small fish um, have a different strategy of reproduction. So uh, for example, shark, many sharks give live births in low numbers. So there's just few of them in the ocean in general. So if I take one shark, it's a much bigger impact than I if I take one sardine or one mackerel. So if I take smaller fish, um, they are more resilient to, to fisheries and we've already figured out better ways to manage them sustainably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's so important mm -hmm. to keep discussing mm -hmm. these issues and like you're doing, keep talking to the fisher people mm -hmm. on the in the local area is so key to actually get accurate information. And, you know, you call it soft research, the interviews that you're doing, mm -hmm. but it's it's kind of the only data we can get sometimes. Right. Yeah. So what I do is called an interdisciplinary approach and we have soft data and hard data. So hard data is the stock assessment, what we discussed before. So these are hard numbers, hard facts on what's going on. But then, as we said before, we lack this data for most fisheries pre-1980s or pre-1970s. So before that, it gets very cloudy. We don't really know what's what's going on. But we still, we need to establish this baseline. And the only thing we have is the soft data, which is, for example, talking to fishermen, retired captains, old logbooks, photos, and so on. And then if we combine the two and piece it all together, we can get a quite solid estimate of what things look like in the ocean before. Wonderful. Uh, tell me about Hasegawa-san that you've talked to that's in the picture here. Uh, Hasegawa-san. We did Shark Week together. So I was on um, Shark Week last year, last summer, and uh, my show was called Alien Shark 5. Um, and Hasegawa-san is the, the captain of the fishing vessel I was on. And he specializes in deep sea fishing. And then again, so you can already see he's, in, he's an older Japanese gentleman. He's in his 70s. He's fished for decades. And he was also very, very happy to share his knowledge with me. So we were fishing for deep sea sharks. And in this case, it was catch and release. So I was sampling the sharks and then they were released again because they were targeting not the sharks, they were targeting another deep sea species um, for um, for consumption. And he was absolutely supportive of our, my research. I remember there was one uh, part, I don't know if anyone has seen the, the Shark Week episode, where we caught um, a six scale shark. They're absolutely massive. So they're so big that we couldn't get it on the ship. But I really wanted a sample because it's such a rare chance for for science to, to get a sample. And so we have this few hundred kilos of shark. And then um, Hasegawa san, he was like, I'm going to get it for you. And he's like hanging off the side of the boat, like uh, taking like a, a tiny tissue sample from one of the sharks um, 
fins for me. So he's very, very supportive of research. He's very interested in what I'm doing. And then also, this was my experience with Japanese fishermen. So yes, they want to keep fishing. This is this is their this is their business. Often has been for generations. So of course, they're reluctant to keep it uh, to 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 give it up. But at the same time, when we talked about it, they were very open to fishing regulations or management, where even fishermen themselves, like Hasegawa-san, have told me, like, oh, I noticed I catch a lot of females like pregnant females in this area or I catch a lot of juveniles here so I kind of want to avoid these areas and I'm I'm happy to just go to another area or that they know um, for example seasons when certain species are about to mate or about to give birth so that they're like oh yeah I'm fine with not targeting the species in this season so they're definitely very very cooperative that's awesome mm -hmm. Uh, I love Felix. Thanks for your <laughs> comment and your award. Felix says, go Hasegawa-san. Yes, go, go. We want to support yeah. him as well. Because yeah. anyone who's trying to protect um, the ecosystem, protect overfishing, we definitely want to support them. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, let's look at another video that you sent me. You sent me such sure. good videos. Um, this one with the rays. Mm -hmm. Where is this? This is Costa Rica as well. Canyo Canyo Island um, Marine Reserve. That's amazing. And in this picture, you also um, in Okinawa, is that right? Yes. Yeah, this is me free diving in Okinawa, where I also did research. What we saw before was the bait of remote underwater video where I had that contraption. It's the baby lemon sharks that was Okinawa. Um, quick word about the manta. Um, I'm sure there's many uh, ocean lovers here, so you're all familiar with manta rays. This manta is completely black. Um, it's what we call the melanistic form of a manta, and it's so rare. And I remember earlier this year, I was watching a documentary and there was a black manta or melanistic manta in the in the documentary. And it's like, oh, it's my dream to one day see one of them. And this manta just came by. So they're so rare. They're kind of what a panther, what a black panther is to a leopard. And we know this melanistic form, like an animal that usually has other colors being completely black. In the ocean, we only know it of um mantas and devil rays so for me it was just like literally one of the best moments of my life seeing this and yeah it occurs at a marine biological reserve Kanyu island is extremely strict no one lives there no one can fish there it's an absolute no-take zone um and this is also where we saw the video we had before was just like huge gorgeous fish swarm is just like fish and fish and fish and you can't even see the ocean anymore this is also Kanyu Island. So we see what ocean protection can do for our oceans because this is what they're supposed to look like. There's supposed to be thousands and thousands of smaller fish that are schooling and then there is supposed to be these, these rare animals just <laughs> randomly gliding by like mantas. And also when I was diving at Kanyu Island, there was never a moment when I didn't see sharks. Like whenever I was looking next to me or below me or above me, there, there was always sharks. And that's what the ocean is supposed to look like. Yeah, gorgeous. Um, one of the things that, I'll just turn the video off so we can hear better. <laughs> uh, one of the things that, that you talk about is how policy is so important for conservation. That what you talked about just now, that having certain areas where it's a no fish zone, um, so that the creatures can grow and have babies and b have areas where they're not hunted. Mm -hmm. um, you think that that policy might work in Japan or are there areas like this in Japan? Of course, of course there are. Japan also has a lot of MPAs, so Marine Protected Area, MPA. And Japan has a lot. Um, they're very fragmented in Japan. So Japan actually has thousands of them and they're usually very small in size. So it's not like one large big area, but it's thousands of small ones. And they're governed by each individual prefecture or a municipality. So Japan has very much um, bottom up management. So here the individual communities or also the individual fishing towns have a lot of governing power over um, the fishing grounds or just the ocean itself so they designate this 
from Okinawa to Hokkaido. And they vary a lot in Japan. So of course we can have the, oh yeah, nice map of Japan. So Japan is, when it comes to the sea, Japan has, even though it's not the biggest country, one of the largest uh, exclusive economic zones, you know, the ocean that belongs to Japan in the world, because they're an island nation, because they're, they're so elongated and they have like all these small islands off the coast. So MPAs in Japan, some of them are really good. They're as good as Kanyo Island, where we saw some videos from, where we have high biodiversity, where we have really good protective laws. So there are no take zones, no one can fish there. Others are still called a marine protected area, but they might still allow fishing rights or other things, which sometimes might make them more, um, make them less effective. And then, uh, Joy, can you just quickly go back to the picture of the, oh, yes. the, the, the coral? Okay. So doesn't look as exciting in the photo. Maybe oh, not as beautiful. exciting. Maybe not as beautiful. exciting as a, as a shark, but this coral is in Hachijojima. Hachijojima is an island that belongs to Tokyo off the coast of Japan. And what we see here is 100% coral cover. So absolutely beautiful, dense, pristine, healthy coral. And I've been scuba diving for 25 years. And this is increasingly rare to see, sadly. So we've lost 50% of our coral reefs in the world. And Japan has actually some of the healthiest reefs, what I've seen, Hachijojima, Okinawa, when it comes to coral. So they've really, really preserved the coral beautifully. And Japan is not getting everything right. And we also see what some players in Japan are still doing wrong. But this is one thing what I really love about Japan. They have managed to protect a lot of their coral reefs. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, healthy, amazing, healthy coral. That is mm -hmm. true. I mean, it's so rare. And I grew up in mm -hmm. Hawaii. And <laughs> I also did some diving in Hawaii. And when I went back, um, after a few years to the same area, even in Hawaii, you, you start to see the coral reefs are not as beautiful as they were before. It's, yeah. you know, it's yeah. something we should all be talking about no matter where we are in the world. Uh, Felix also mentioned he likes your shark mug. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my, my beautiful shark is a present for my brother. <laughs> It's so a sharkastic, nice. yeah. yeah. Sharkastic, I love that. Yeah. Um, one of the other things you mentioned is how there are some very unique species of shark in Japan, and I believe this picture is one of them. Oh, this is a, a Japanese um, horn shark. So yes, uh, Jap Japan has actually the highest shark biodiversity in the world. I think um, around 120 species. And there are species of shark that are endemic to Japan. So endemic means found in Japan, found nowhere else. So Japanese um, bullet shark is one of them. They're so cute. Um, they're really, really docile. Like, please don't touch them when you see them because you shouldn't harass them, but they're actually a shark. You cannot could pet. Um, but if you want to do so, apart from wildlife harassment, also be careful. If you look at the fins, they have thorns. They have um, poisonous thorns on their back as a defense. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. So, in, and then I think I saw, I can't zoom in, but I mm -hmm. think I saw a picture of this closer. And uh, it mm -hmm. actually, it has like a horn on yeah, the, yeah. the top, right? Yeah, so it's called bullhead shark or horn shark. And yeah, so the, the two big fins we see on the back, so the, the first and the second dorsal fin, if you look closely, you can see, and at the front part, like towards the head, we can see the little, the little horn or basically the thorn sticking up that is a defense mechanism of the shark because they're small. As you can see in the picture, smaller sharks that so have other predators that prey on them. That's how they defend themselves. Wow, amazing. Uh, we did have a question about Fukushima that's been in the news recently mm -hmm. about the dumping of the water. Um, you've worked a lot in that area, in that Tohoku region. Um, have you talked to the, the fisher people about how they feel about what's happening up there with Fukushima? Of course. So um, I was in Kesanuma, which is around 300 kilometers um, from Fukushima, so it's in it's still like in the area in the vicinity. And the fishers were of course concerned what it's gonna do to the wildlife. 
um, so yeah, if we look where we see, like we have Tokyo and then we have Sendai, the other like um, city that's marked. So around Sendai, that's where Kesenuma, where I was based and where Fukushima are, are near to there. So yeah, they're very concerned and it's it's a decade ago now. And this is not my field of expertise, but yeah, of course we can uh, expect effects on the wildlife. So we've already seen with Chernobyl in the 80s, how this affected wildlife in Europe, uh, mainly on land. So what we can draw on there is um, Chernobyl brought us radioactive rain that went from Eastern Europe all the way to Western Europe, all the way to Germany, where I grew up. And this rain then, so of course, like it rained down on the forest, it got captured in the soil, it got captured in the moss, it got captured in the mushrooms. So for us, it was for decades for us, it was like, do not go to the forest and collect mushrooms, which was a popular activity in Germany back in the day, because they're going to be, they're going to carry radiation. And then animals in the forest, like wild boar, are going to consume these mushrooms, and then you're going to have wild boar with radiation. So these were concerns in, in Europe for many, many years, and we can expect the same thing or similar thing for the ocean. Now, of course, the ocean works a little differently, which is the ocean has currents. So the water is constantly moving. And that means the radiation doesn't stay so much in one place, but it gets, depending on where it hits, if there's a lot of current, uh, it gets dispersed, which is, of course, first of all, now this is like, oh my God, it's going to, go everywhere it sounds it, it sounds potentially scary but the ocean is a big place so it gets diluted and um, potentially diluted down like when it gets carried out into minuscule levels that are just natural background radiation that's not uh it's not dangerous anymore but i would have to check again i looked a few years ago uh, early research papers on how it's affected the coastal environment around fukushima and they couldn't find too much effect yet on like marine plants, marine invertebrates and marine fish, because this is just like a few years in. So we might have long term effects, um, how it could where we could see maybe effects on the DNA, the re um, the reproduction or or others. So the main thing we would have to watch here for is probably the plants, marine plants. And uh, filter feeders, so things like bow valves, clamps, and so on. Uh, it's such a big and ongoing issue. And I think, um, you know, even mm. in terms of politics, a lot of the yeah. time it doesn't get enough coverage. Uh, so people have the idea that it's over, but it is something that's continuing, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that was brought up in Sea Spiracy, and of course, I see it every month when I do cleanups, um, is plastic problem from the fishing mm -hmm. industry. Is this something that you talk about with the fisher people that you you research with? I do. I do. Um, so first of all, Sea Spiracy did the right thing by mentioning it. So what they mentioned is what we call ghost gear. So the net that keeps on fishing because it was dumped somewhere. And then if no one removes this net, it will keep on ensnaring and entangling fish, turtles, marine mammals like dolphins, and they will die. And the numbers were a bit wrong in sea spiracy. So I think they were outdated. I might have confused some numbers because we have to remember sea spiracy was done by layman people. And they were looking at scientific papers and maybe they were not so skilled at, at identifying all the data in there, which I do not think they did on purpose. But I think they mentioned like, oh, like 50% of the ocean plastic is uh, ghost gear, abandoned fishing gear. That used to be true at one point. Now it's more like 20%, which is still huge. But this also means we really, really have to look at the other plastic that gets in the ocean just from our on land uh, consumption of plastic. So ghost gear is a huge problem. It's absolutely disastrous. And we don't really have like the one silver bullet on how to deal with it yet. So again, by the ocean currents I described before, it means they eventually all the currents put all the plastic that's floating around, be it fishing nets or be it um, Coke bottles, um, got, it's gonna end up in the same in the same spot or in the same spots where these currents uh, meet and converge. And one uh, very, very famous spot is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. 
So this is where currents meet. That's the kind of the final point. We have a lot of plastic there. So there's efforts to clean that up, um, which is great. But I think much more we should look at let's not have any more plastic entering the ocean. So the majority of the kind of human online consumption plastic enters the ocean from rivers, uh, especially in Southeast Asia. So that's this would be like if we want to remove the bulk of that problem, Southeast Asia, rivers, river mouths, can we filter out the plastic there? Or can we just have proper waste management policies in these countries, which of course is hard because we're talking about developing countries. Um, they do not often do not have any waste management like we are used to in more developed countries. Um, so that would be the first step to stop it from getting into the river, into the ocean. And the fishing, abandoned fishing gear. So again, there has to be policy and rules. And there's many players like um, New Zealand, US, Japan, Australia, um, the good players, the monitor players, they were very unlikely to abandon their, their fishing gear just into the ocean. But then we have so many of the other unmonitored fishing fleets that will just do that without care for, for consequences. And yeah, we just need better regulation to stop that. Yeah, I, I mean, one, one thing we do find a lot um, is pieces of styrofoam, which comes from the fishing industry in Japan, because we're mm -hmm. cleaning up in the inland sea in Japan. So we know it's from Japan, mm -hmm. not from other mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. uh, we also find a lot of plastic piping, which is used in the oyster industries. Mm -hmm. um, I know that they found this plastic piping in Jap in Hawaii, as far as Hawaii. So this is not this is a problem from Japan that we can definitely mm -hmm. do better. And yeah. when I talk to uh, some people doing sustainable tourism with oyster uh, people, they're trying to encourage them to use bamboo, what they used to use, or use rope. So there are solutions, even if we just look back 10, 15, 20 years in the past, what they used to use. I know it's so hard because plastic is so convenient in many ways, but um, it just creates such a huge problem, which is, you know, so long lasting. Yeah, yeah. These are great examples. I don't know much about the the, the inland sea in, in Japan, so where you are, Hiroshima. So it's like sheltered for all these islands with lots of bays. So yeah, that means most likely this is local. And yeah, as you said, like the best would be to go to the source where it's just coming from oyster farming or um, the styrofoam is probably floaters. So the nets are like held at the surface floating and then stuff breaks off. Um, a styrofoam piece is not as harmful as a whole fishing net that keeps on fishing, but it yeah. still shouldn't be in the ocean. And they used to they used to float, um, of course, with other things. They used other things um, like wood. So yeah, yeah. Let's let's go back to things that mm -hmm. if the uh, sea creatures eat them, it doesn't harm them, and of course, doesn't end up back in our bodies too, um, mm -hmm. in the the whole ecosystem, right? Um, now, interesting point from yesterday's talk with Felix, when he did his cycle around Shikoku, he went to a remodeled old school, which had an aquarium inside, and they actually had some garbage, plastic floating garbage, and they called it like sea friends, our new sea friends, to, to start to educate the kids that go there about the problems with plastic pollution. Yeah. So I thought that was really creative really interesting yeah. yeah so i i love these um awareness projects and sometimes it can be something so small there is um there's a very talented uh, nature photographer uh, in okinawa who also takes contracts for example national geographic and he has a tiny project that's making huge impact because he takes pictures of hermit crabs you know the hermit crabs we see on the beach that are usually in in shells like like these and he shows how they're using plastic now. So there's like these small hermit crabs that are using, for example, the, the caps of pet bottles or as a human plastic, because for two reasons, A, they could find the plastic and B, maybe they couldn't find the shells anymore because uh, they've been collected away. And what he's doing now, and uh, I'll be going back to Okinawa later this month, and what I also, how I'm like, now I'm looking at this small like box of shells of like collected here. Um, I'm gonna return these. So I'm gonna return them to him. And then he has a, 
a trade-in project where he, when he sees the hermit crabs with the plastic, he offers them a real shell um, so that they can, basically the hermit crab can go back to nature. And that's also what I'm going to do is like, oh yeah, I have a lot of shells and uh, we can go to the beach. And like, if you really, really want to take something, I mean, please take nothing. You can take this, this is a, a, a scallop shell. This, what happens is this has become sand. But this is not used, uh, apart from becoming sand, it's not used by the hermit crabs. But yeah, please don't collect the shells um, that could be hermit crab homes anymore. Um, so yeah, there, he made this return project where he's like, hey, Okinawa. And so people live in Okinawa. Please give me back the shells so I can give them to my hermit crabs. And because he has such beautiful pictures on Facebook and Instagram, with lots of followers, people are really into it. Yeah, I think that's a great way. I think we yeah. can use social media or live streaming like this with experts like you where people can engage and ask questions. It's so key to the way forward and understanding how we can live in balance. Um, I think a lot of people want to know, but there's just they're confused by the information or maybe like see spiracy. It's a little bit too uh, much entertainment, so mm -hmm. they don't know if they can trust it. Right. Um, you also, you're a writer mm -hmm. and you often cover like sustainable tourism ideas besides this amazing uh, diving experience, which has become like a sustainable tourism to help protect the sharks. Um, in other ways, can you think of other ways where tourism might be helping, for example, um, other dive areas in Okinawa or other fisheries like using sustainable methods for oyster farming or do you know of, of any other? Of course, because um, ecotourism or now we like to call it sustainable tourism, what it offers is alternative livelihood. So if we think of communities that previously have relied on harvesting ocean resources, so catching fish, um, to to survive now they have an alternative way to make income and then if we look for example at Canyo Island which I recently visited in Costa Rica so Canyo Island has a great function because it brings tourism dollars for the country it helps hotels dive shops and so on to operate if there was absolutely no function for humans of Canyo Island I would still be so happy that it's protected um, but it would probably be harder for, for the government, local government or the local people to report it. And uh, that, of course, is, is a huge incentive. And another thing what we also saw is um, a colleague of mine has written up a very interesting article how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the oceans. And in the first few weeks, we saw kind of click, a little bit clickbaity videos of like, oh, look, the ocean has recovered now that humans are not messing with it anymore, like dolphins in the canals of Venice kind of type of clickbaity stuff. And now over a year in, we know the actual um, fallout for the ocean was not so positive. Um, now, of course, again, there's like other clickbaity articles it's like, oh, look, our single use masks are floating in the ocean. Yeah, that's a, a small part of the problem. A much bigger part is with the pandemic, tourism was curbed and now we had these local populations in often developing countries that have given up their fishing past or they've given up on like poaching so illegally taking marine resources because they had alternative income streams through tourism and now that was gone so i think we can imagine what happened out of desperation they uh, partly had to go back to that and another thing that also happened is these marine protected areas in Japan or in other places like Costa Rica, they need to be patrolled. If I, if I want to protect something, I can't build a fence in the ocean. I need to patrol it. So patrols need to be present so that bad players can be caught, fined and taken out. And the patrols have also been um, become less or more difficult during COVID because either the funding was lacking because the tourism dollars weren't coming in, um, marine protected areas and national parks, they also finance themselves. If you visit the area or the park, you pay a fee. Now this wasn't happening because tourists weren't there. So um, the COVID-19 pandemic has showed us how important sustainable tourism is for the ocean. That is such a good point. I didn't think mm -hmm. of that. But of course, mm -hmm. anybody who's getting a revenue from tourism and doing ecotourism or sustainable tourism in particular, um, they've been that's been developed over the years to get them away from 
less um, protective practices, right? And then mm -hmm. now there's no tourism, so they don't have that income. I didn't think of that. Very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have about five more minutes. Can you tell us some of your projects you're excited about working on now or this year? Um, very good question, because for me, things have also slowed down a little bit with COVID. So there was like things and planning that then didn't happen. Um, I still hope to film again for Shark Week in Japan, on different parts of Japan, um, showcasing more of Japan's amazing shark biodiversity and its beauty. And another thing that we wanted to work on that, that again, because of COVID, it was a little bit difficult to pull off, was um, to tackle shark fishing in a southern area of Japan. So again, to go into dialogue with the local fishing cooperative and to ask them to reduce or completely phase out their shark fishing activities. And I'm not the first person who's on it. So others have done this before. Others have also collected data, monitored it. And then again, interestingly, we had like a few of the more like aggressive um, players. And then as, if you can imagine, if I, if I come to your office and, and yell at you and tell you you're a murderer and everything you're doing is wrong, you might not want to talk to me. Um, so after this, we tried a more um, like a more dialogue approach. And they surprisingly actually have been open to it. And I think also the, even though there were more radical players before, they said like, you have to stop this completely. Um, they also kind of planted the seed for like, maybe instead of shark tourism, uh, sorry, maybe instead of shark fishing, this could be a tourism thing. And even though the fish, fisheries cooperative, the uh, local fishermen were um, not going into dialogue with them, absolutely opposed to that. I think it planted a seed where now there are, they have said like, oh yeah, actually we would be interested in phasing this out and see how we can turn this into a tourism activity. So hopefully we can pick this back up and see if there's um, a way where we can channel this, um, funnel this along, or also just like advise them on how to how to make that change. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, having a dialogue and trying to influence policy is so important. Thank you for all your work mm -hmm. you're doing. Um, if people want to follow you and find out more about your programs and activities, uh, can you tell us a bit about where you are online? Um, for me, mainly is my Instagram. So my Facebook is, um, I, I like to keep, yes, that's my Instagram. Um, uh, my, say on my Facebook, I like to keep private. Then you can also find some of my articles, my write-up on Save Our Seas Foundation. So I'm, I'm a scholar of Save Our Seas. So you can find more about some of my past projects there. And yeah, Instagram is the main way I interact with the public. That's great. Well, thank you so mm. much. And keep up the good work. Um, do you see mm -hmm. kind of an intersection between your work as a writer, uh, talking about sustainability in Japan through Tokyo Chipo, and what you're doing to save the seas? Can you see how it works together? I think it always works together because one of the main way that, say, normal people or average people who are not scientists, who are not like working with the ocean, how they can interact with the ocean is tourism. And that's also why I think it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. Like I've written a lot about, for example, whale watching in Japan and we, whale watching is a growing industry in Japan. And I think it's fantastic because the these there's local people that set up whale watching tours, whale swim tours, and it shows it shows, I mean, they just love whales. Most, 90% of Japanese people do not condone whaling. They do not consume whale. But it just shows even the other ones like, hey, there's other ways to interact with whales than, than killing them and, and so on. So like a lot of my writing I've written about like um, ecotourism opportunities, uh, where can I see whales, do sharks, dolphins, turtles? and so on in Japan, because uh, as we know, you only protect what you love. And then if you want to love it, I think the first thing you have to do is like have an experience with it. Yeah, I, I think that's so true. And mm -hmm. uh, that also was so disappointing for me when I saw Seaspiracy is how horribly Japan is portrayed. 
mm-hmm. and Japan fisher people are portrayed. And it's it's really even for most Japanese people, like you said, it's it's not something that most people would embrace. We know that there is mm-hmm. no demand for whale meat, for example, that most people don't support that that industry. So exactly yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a really negative impression of Japan. So I hope viewers can realize that that's not normal Japanese people. Yeah, I, I, I really hope so, because we have such good examples of like very old traditional artisanal fishing masses in Japan that are gentle on the ocean, where resources are well managed. And yet the majority of Japanese people know they do not want whaling. They do not want whale meat or dolphin meat or any of those things. And um, while it's good and it's right to still expose this, I will always want to put it in perspective to say like, hey, this is only a few towns in Japan and this is what most Japanese people think about it. Like put it in in perspective because as a documentary maker, I think you have responsibility to, you will stir opinions and influence and to inform well and balanced. Yeah. So So hopefully what we can do uh, Mm -hmm. is keep highlighting these amazing examples. Like mm-hmm. you have near Tokyo with uh, yeah. diverting the sharks to a yeah. dive spot or something. I love yeah. the, those ideas and all the work you're doing. So thank you so much. No, thank you for this opportunity, Joy. It's really, a, it's, as always, a joy to talk to you. <laughs> Fantastic. I would love yeah. to show this yeah. deep video, this that diving video of what the fish should look like in yeah. all areas. As, as we leave everyone thank you everyone for joining today it's such a beautiful video you must have felt so happy yeah i was in the ocean. i was, was incomplete bliss <laughs> that's gorgeous uh tomorrow, thank you everyone yeah thank you everybody for joining today tomorrow morning we are talking with uh oh tomorrow evening we're talking with chris somerville about his travels. Also, he was in Okinawa and he teaches environmental education Ooh. at university. So that'll be an interesting perspective as well. Thank you so much, Marik. Have a good day, Thank everyone. You. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.